welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is Jason Augie, the Senior Vice President of Sports Tourism for the Tampa Bay Sports Commission. We are here to discuss from Super Bowl to March Madness, hosting major sporting events in Tampa Bay. Welcome, Jason. Hey, Angela. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to join you today. We're excited to have you as well, I, and I know that you work for the Tampa Bay Sports Commission. You've been there for quite some time. It's a nonprofit organization that prepares bids to host sports and entertainment events in the Tampa Bay region. So as the senior vice president of sports tourism for this group, what does your day-to-day -day job usually look like? Yeah, sure. So I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, you know, working for this company for almost 18 years now, you know, we've been fortunate to host some of the biggest and best events, you know, in the sports and entertainment, um, you know, realm, uh, if you will. And you know, from Super Bowls to NCAA championships to WrestleMania um, to, you know, some of the bigger youth and amateur tournaments in traditional and non-traditional sports. Um, my job is really to, you know, kind of guide the uh, the company, if you will, in our overall sales and marketing efforts, um, overseeing our bid process, how our recruiting efforts, and then making sure that, you know, we're delivering on the promises that we make in each of the uh, the proposals that we submit uh, to these different organizations to try and host their events in uh, in Tampa, Florida. Tell me a little bit about the the contracts that you have. What kind of requests or requirements are pretty typical for hosting an event? Yeah, so it's a great question. So every event that we host, and you know, when you look at the youth and amateur space, we're traditionally hosting anywhere from 70 to 90 events in a given fiscal year, again, in just about any sport you can name. And then when you get to the bigger ticket major events, uh, it obviously is, uh, you know, quite a production um, on somewhat of a parallel path, I would say. And, you know, each entity, when they're putting out their uh, request for a proposal or RFP, um, you know, they kind of stipulate, you know, what's important to them. And, you know, that's the thing with our organization. I think we do really well is we customize each proposal. It's not a, a cookie cutter approach where we're, uh, you know, taking one uh, proposal and then just retrofitting it in a way where it's like, okay, yeah, this is good for, you know, everyone. It's more so how do we customized to show each individual group that we're working with that we, you know, value their business and obviously um, want to cater to their needs. So, whereas you may see a NCAA championship RFP that could be you know, anywhere from 40 to 50 pages, you may see, you know, a Super Bowl bid, um, you know, that's 75 to 90 pages, um, you know, we're creating, um, you know, huge proposals um, that are, you know, the size of phone books, if you remember those from back in the day, um, <laughs> with content. Um, and then in a lot of cases, too, you know, we're able to streamline on the youth and amateur side where we're creating a lot of memos of understanding um, and agreements um, with those event organizers to basically um, explain where we're coming from and what we can do and, you know, showcase our commitment to uh, to them as far as what our contributions will be both financially and in kind. So 75 to 90 pages, that's a lot. I, I imagine it's difficult. How do you keep things from getting missed or lost or mis misinterpreted even? Yeah, no, it's, it's good. That's a good question too. I think, you know, you, you have to be very judicious about planning out your, uh, your efforts. And a lot of the time, you know, you have different bids and proposals that are running concurrently. Um, so, you know, making sure that you're on top of, you know, your planning and, and coordinating and, and execution efforts is obviously paramount. So we'll work internally as a team to kind of set the course of who's going to handle what and then what those timelines are. And as being the intermediary or the main agent and brokering the deals, you know, to help bring, um, you know, the venue component to the table, you obviously have the accommodations uh, piece where we're bringing all the hotels um, into the fold. And then you have all the ancillary or special events that come along with it. What does the marketing and promotional plan look like? What does your volunteer support um, system, uh, you know, include? I mean, every single proposal has kind of some key 
um, elements that are you know relatively central at each one of the things that we do or or the events that we uh, go after and target. But you've got to be really buttoned up to ensure that you're working. Um, you know, very effectively and efficiently so that things don't get down to the wire. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, we don't have an answer from this partner or we don't have an answer from that partner where we're establishing, you know, uh, the right timelines to be able to do it at a, at a high level. And have you ever found yourself getting the bid for uh, to host an event and deciding in negotiations that it wasn't a good fit and kind of backing away after the fact. Yeah, you know, normally I would say 99% of the time when we go through the RFP process where, and, and the timing on this is fantastic, having just returned back from a uh, one of the lead uh, industry trade shows last week um, where we had 55 one-on-one -on -one meetings, like almost in a speed dating format, uh, pre-qualified appointments with groups that we felt really, you know, could be a good fit in Tampa, or we wanted to learn more about what their business model looked like. So many conversations now taking place just a few days later with those pers prospective organizations uh, as far as identifying opportunities. And so what happens is, you know, in looking through the request for proposal, we'll look at it through a fine, with a fine tooth comb to identify, okay, these are the things we feel like we can you know, make happen based on the request. And there may be some things that we uh, denote as an exception, things that we wouldn't necessarily be able to agree to. And then from there, it becomes a conversation. You know, are these things that you as the event organizer have flexibility on uh, to where, you know, you may be willing to, um, you know, grant an exception from our side. And then maybe there's some things that we can do on our side where, you know, we raise our level of support in another area to kind of make up for, you know, what may be a shortcoming. So long way of saying, as you go through the process, the biggest thing we found is just being transparent and candid throughout. Like a lot of the relationships, you know, we're trying to foster are ones that we hope will be deep rooted and long lasting. So there's not a sense from obviously our organization or a lot of the event organizers that we work, you know, with, uh, that anyone is trying to pull anything on everybody. Everyone's, you know, in it for the same reason, trying to find, you know, a mutually beneficial solution. And more often than not, uh, we're able to reach it. And, but yes, there are certain groups that, you know, will engage with where based on the business model or, you know, particularly the return on investment, if it's not worth it from how we operate, then we'll pull away from, you know, the deal in a, in a respectful and professional manner. Absolutely. That that makes a lot of sense. And I would imagine with your history and success of hosting large events, you're probably a trusted partner. So a lot of groups are probably eager to work with you and, and maybe make those exceptions, as you mentioned, um, to, to develop that relationship. I know in the month of November, you're promoting events like skateboarding, soccer, hockey events. So what dictates how involved you are with each of these events? Um, you know, it's, I imagine some of them are probably more hands-on and others, um, probably other partners can take the lead. So what kind of dictates your involvement with these events? Yeah, I think from, from the genesis of the conversation and then if we're fortunate enough to be uh, awarded, usually those RFPs and the conversations that proceed, you know, submitting the proposal. And then if you are awarded, um, will kind of dictate what roles and responsibilities will be, um, you know, so whereas certain groups require a lot more um, involvement, you know, others may be more so, hey, can you help us secure uh, the venue and then give us, you know, your contact list for hotels to uh, for us to go uh, and source and, hey, we may need some, you know, volunteer assistance too, and if you don't mind helping promote um, you know, we'll arm you with the press releases, social announcements, things like that. So we're still involved very actively with those, but those are kind of the, the lesser of the two, I would say. Um, and then you have some groups where we're along for the ride, you know, where it's planning meetings or planning calls weekly to try and help build out um, how the event is activated, um, you know, encompassing a lot of the points from the first example, but then even, you know, bigger ticket on a larger scale with, you know, all the ins and outs and you know, idiosyncrasies that go with each one of the events that uh, that we host. So I think each individual 
uh, event, you know, there, there are separate conversations that take place to identify, you know, what our role is. But at the end of the day, when the ball, you know, tips or is kicked off, that's when, you know, the event organizer or the league or the, or the entity that's running point really takes the reins um, on the execution side and then will help, you know, with some of the ancillary programming. And the events like the Super Bowl, March Madness, are those events where you're more hands-on and along for the ride, as you mentioned? Yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, you know, the, probably one of the best examples is the college football playoff national championship. We started, you know, we hosted in 2017. We were the first uh, location in the Southeast United States to be awarded uh, that event. And that was a five-year process. Um, and so from start to finish, you know, we lost out on the in initial bid uh, to Dallas, knowing that they were likely going to be the first host. But, you know, our goal was to come to the table with a very strong offer. And then um, when we were uh, eventually awarded as the first location in the southeast, we wanted to knock it out of the park. And, you know, to your point earlier about, you know, your reputation and um, we take a lot of pride on, as I mentioned at the top of the show, delivering on the promises that uh, uh, that we make. And so for that, I mean, you're in the trenches <clears throat> with groups like the College Football Playoff or the National Football League or the NCAA or the uh, NHL on a lot of those, you know, marquee or major events that you host where, I mean, every single aspect of behind the scenes that goes on with hosting a major event our team is heavily involved um, to, you know, the coordination uh, and execution side, and then obviously complementing the efforts that are being put forth by uh, those entities. So, yeah, it, it was it was an interesting uh, dichotomy, if you will, you know, trying to balance or blend your responsibilities with your youth and amateur uh, events, which are truly our bread and butter and foundation for what we do on an annual basis with the roles and responsibilities of what is expected when you're hosting these marquee major events, because in theory, you could be spending every single day on one of those two, but we had to find a way, um, you know, to balance and, and obviously execute at a, uh, you know, a high level. Absolutely. So when you are in the trenches, what kind of challenges have you encountered? Well, I mean, first and foremost, you know, the, COVID is probably the first one that comes to mind. I mean, we were a week out from hosting uh, the men's uh, basketball first and second rounds, um, and then three weeks out from hosting our first ever WrestleMania. And so the process and work that had been done leading up to, you know, those moments, and then you have that whole unwind period where you're having to um, work through all the different logistics that had been coordinated and you know, calling everything off um, to then it became, okay, how do we, you know, tactfully, uh, when the timing is right, engage on ways to get the events back. And then we were fortunate, you know, with WrestleMania to get it back. And then we had Super Bowl, you know, then it becomes, how do you operate safely, you know, against the backdrop of a pandemic, which was no small feat. So when we were going through the planning, uh, you know, planning cycle, if you will, with, you know, both WWE and the NFL, it was, um, trying to um, work through plan A, B, C, D, E, F, if these, you know, things were to happen. And so, you know, constantly being fluid and, and you know, um, you know, thinking on your feet to a degree, but also planning um, for every situation became really challenging. But in the end, uh, it all worked out. I mean, you know, it, it was icing on the cake in the sense that the Buccaneers became the first team to play in their home stadium for a Super Bowl during the pandemic had never happened before. That brought it a whole new slew of challenges because obviously you have all these people in the Tampa Bay area who now want to be a part of Super Bowl uh, above and beyond the normal interest level because their team is participating and with cap ticket numbers, with special events that had uh, only a finite number of uh, passes available, you know, trying to socially distance and be cognizant of, you know, everything that went along with it um, presented some challenges. But in the end, you know, a lot of smart people came together um, and, you know, worked to create an environment where we were able to operate it uh, effectively and then obviously safely. And for what it represented, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the first major sporting event to be hosted uh, you know, during a pandemic, what it represented for hope, I think, for the country, 
in a lot of ways, it was a uh, an incredibly um, uh, amazing feeling in terms of the intrinsic value that we were able to derive by pulling it off. And Florida had fewer restrictions than some other places, so that probably assisted in your uh, ability to execute yeah. the event. Yeah, I mean, yeah, with, without getting into the politics of it, I mean, the, the fact is Florida was open for for business and that certainly opened a lot of doors and, and led to a lot of conversations. Uh, I can't tell you how many, and, and then, you know, back to your point about challenges, that challenge actually became an opportunity uh, right. because we were able to host at such a high level Super Bowl and then three months later with WrestleMania, which was the first time a city had ever hosted those two events in the same calendar year. Um, you know, it opened the door to where we were receiving calls, emails nonstop from different groups from different parts of the country saying, hey, we'd like to bring our event to Tampa. And so it's created this uh, huge boon for us um, in terms of future events that we've been able to uh, host and then, um, you know, book for, for, down the, for down the road. How do you think you were able to secure those uh, high profile marquee events that you mentioned? Well, I think it, uh, you know, that old adage, you only have one chance to make a first impression really does play true. And, and we're not a community that rests on its laurels. Uh, we talk internally about, you know, you judge an event's success by whether or not it returns. And, you know, as evidenced by the fact of, you know, this April will host the NCAA Frozen Four, the Men's College Hockey National Championship for the third time. Uh, in December of 23, we'll have the Women's Volleyball Championship for the second time. In 25, we have our fourth Women's Final Four. Um, and then 26, March Madness is coming back for, I believe, the sixth time. So, you know, you look at that, and I think that's a really important important and impressive metric for us. Um, you know, groups that are uh, continuing to come to Tampa are doing so for good reason, because it's not just, okay, here's the, here's the offer. <clears throat> We're coming to Tampa. Good luck to you. Um, we're there almost every step of the way uh, to ensure that we're delivering either, you know, a solid student athlete experience or, and, and then obviously for any and all visitors, um, you know, rolling out the red carpet for them. Every geographic location has its unique weather challenges and Tampa is no exception to that. Recently, um, Florida was hit with with a hurricane, a category four hurricane, Hurricane Ian. Um, luckily, Tampa was spared the, the brunt of that impact, but I imagine that hurricanes, weather, weather incidents are really a strong piece of your planning process with uh, being located on the, the coast and lots of shoreline. So talk to me a little bit about what kind of plans do you make for weather? Sure. Yeah. I mean, well, hurricanes are obviously front and center, right? You know, in terms of that period where you traditionally see them in that August, September, and even into uh, October time frame, And Yes, we were very fortunate being uh, spared with the late shift. We feel terrible for, you know, our neighbors to the south and, you know, and talking to our counterparts we hear everyone's doing well. But yes, I mean, the rebuild process as part of that is uh, is incredibly challenging. I remember when our Convention and Visitors Bureau, Visit Tampa Bay, was hosting the Republican National Convention in 2012. It's a fall event um, or fall convention, and there was a threat of hurricane, but similarly, it shifted uh, a couple days out, but the planning, you know, uh, that goes around that is, is pretty intense because ultimately when you're hosting an event, safety is one of the uh, most important, if not the most important things. And there's a trickle down effect to that too. Obviously you think about hurricanes, but then also, you know, in Tampa Bay, you're in the lightning capital of, uh, of the, the US. And so when you're hosting outdoor events, you have to be aware uh, and work with event organizers, work with your facilities to say, okay, we have lightning strike detectors that, you know, it, um, you know, what is the distance in terms of, you know, that distance from that strike um, where we're going to shut down play and send everyone to their cars or, you know, send everyone to uh, uh, safety. And, you know, that's, uh, that's something we take very seriously as well. You know, you've had situations from, you know, college football games or professional football games at Raymond James Stadium where, you know, you see a lightning strike and it's delayed another 30 minutes. And while it's frustrating, you do it for the right reasons because of safety. And the same thing holds true at a youth soccer tournament or in a, a senior softball 
uh, competition. I mean, the, 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 it's, it's a huge part of uh, what we all do because the last thing we want to have happen is someone, um, you know, who's, uh, who gets hurt or, uh, or even worse. Yeah, like in 2008 in Atlanta, that the SEC men's basketball tournament, the fact that the game went into overtime likely saved a lot of fans who stayed for the game when a tornado touched down outside of the the Georgia Dome. So yeah. it's amazing how some event like the game going into overtime can really do um, a service to protect the the spectators. Yeah, and, and that's a good point because you know you can plan and plan and plan, but there are some things that are outside of your control. I don't know that anyone, and I was at that game. I was uh, I was inside the Georgia Dome when that hit, and it was uh, unlike anything I've experienced. And you know you have to think sometimes the luck you know plays a uh, a role. You know as much as you want to plan, uh, sometimes there are things that are unforeseen or uh, that happen that are outside of everyone's collective control. Absolutely. Did they hold you over in in the Georgia Dome then once they, the tornado hit? They did. Yes. So all the games were uh, essentially uh, stopped. Uh, everyone was moved to shelter in the concourses. And then once it was deemed safe uh, to leave the area, we all went outside and saw, you know, sky bridges uh, torn apart, you know, car windows blown out. Uh, I mean, just a ton of damage. Um, flooding. I mean, all, all types of things that you're just like, you're, it's, it was almost surreal. Uh, but, you know, that's that's what happened. And then other incidents happen, like at the Miami Dolphins game and the tailgating in the parking lot when someone pushed their grill, wasn't quite put out, um, the fire wasn't quite put out and ignited the yep. vehicle and caught other vehicles on fire as well. So how do you, how do you kind of manage uh, in events where you have spectators that might be tailgating or, um, you know, they're kind of out in ancillary areas next to and adjacent to the facilities that you're operating? Yeah, I think inherently, you know, with any event, there are different situations or scenarios that can present itself where something could go wrong. You know, I think by, mitigating what is allowed and obviously communicating, you know, kind of an, an FAQ, if you will, or almost, a, you know, now more than ever, you see these no before you go uh, type communications that try and uh, lessen those types of things from happening. Uh, sometimes it can be common sense. Um, sometimes it's bad luck. But uh, I think, you know, with security and, uh, you know, patrolling and all these different things that are enacted, um, to try and help, you know, not have those situations. Uh, I think most locations and venues and events do, you know, take that into account. Um, but every now and again, you're going to have stories like that that arise because of, you know, either just, you know, it's unfortunate timing or bad luck or, you know, you just, you know, you miss something. Um, and that seems what has happened. In regards to transportation, are there... <clears throat> Do a lot of your events require shuttling or transporting of spectators? And um, you know, how does the new how does ride shares like Uber and Lyft change the way you're planning for events when people are trying to get dropped off and picked up? Yeah, I think all of it is encapsulated into the overall planning process. And normally, you know, a transportation committee will be formed or a specific part of the uh, hosting effort will be dedicated to ensuring that transportation um, is done effectively. I mean, I, I've been at events where um, it's run seamlessly, um, and usually you work with, um, you know, traffic um, uh, groups and, and, you know, special event departments uh, who are in charge of that. And, you know, it's, it's something that you don't want to have an event where you can't get to the event. And then you don't want to have an event where when you're leaving the event, you're sitting for 45 minutes to an hour, you know, plus trying to leave. Um, that's something we take very seriously. And, you know, we're fortunate where, you know, everybody plays nicely in the sandbox in the sense that one hand is talking to the other um, and making sure that all of that is taken into account. Rideshare obviously is a huge part of that. It's open doors, uh, you know, where you're lessening, you know, the, the drinking and driving component uh, for those who want to or take, um, but even so, it's making sure you have the correct amount of inventory on hand. And I was in an, I was at an event uh, a few years ago where um, 
it was documented on, you know, not only local news, but then also it made national news. This one organization did not plan accordingly. And they had people in the rain with an event after midnight um, that were waiting an hour and 15 to an hour and 30 to try and get rod share uh, to get out of this isolated stadium that was in the middle of, of nowhere. And that leaves a bad taste, you know, in your mouth. I mean, you can work for a year, two years, three years to plan everything out and everything goes absolutely according to script perfectly. And then you just have that one thing and that's the last thing uh, image in a lot of people's mind and it's just not a good look. So you, you have to, I mean, I, I would put transportation and proper planning, you know, right up there with safety. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then the, the communication piece, marketing piece, talk to me about how integral that is to promoting and branding a good good message for your partners and what kind of considerations do you have to take into place? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's mar the marketing and promotion side is obviously hugely important. Like, like recent example, we just came off of hosting uh, USA Gymnastics, their national championships and national Congress, uh, huge success. And a big reason for that was the collective work you know, that we had done in concert with USA Gymnastics to build out this marketing and promotion plan to reach, um, you know, all different uh, folks and organization, organizations throughout the community. And what it translated to was huge attendance numbers where, you know, befitting of what an event like that would expect. Same thing with the SEC men's basketball tournament when we hosted uh, back in March. Again, you know, you don't, Maybe you may not necessarily think of, of Florida as a huge basketball haven to a degree. Um, but again, when you walked into Amelie Arena, you felt the energy of all those uh, schools from the SEC playing. I mean, it was it was quite an environment. So the marketing and promotional efforts that are deployed uh, as part of that are, are so important. And then using all the different um, you know, tools in your toolbox, if you will, and leveraging relationships and uh, is so critical. And that's why I think we've been successful where, you know, we've hosted these different youth and amateur events that have a huge economic and social impact for our community um, at a very high clip, you know, a lot of events um, each and every year. The major events, you know, in theory only come around once every couple of years, but we've been on a roll where you know, we're almost hosting one every year. What that does is it creates buy-in. Um, you know, we talk a lot about this Team Tampa Bay mantra where everyone is is in it together. It's a unified front. And what it translates to is everyone buying in and supporting the event. So when the next event comes out, you know, it's more so how do I get involved? How can I help? And I think that is uh, it's very organic, very uh, uh, genuine and authentic here. Well, it sounds like you're doing a lot of great things, Jason. Is there any final final message or final words that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, you know, it's it's crazy to think. Well, first off, thanks for the opportunity to join today. And, and it's it's amazing to think, you know, 18, coming up on 18 years here, still have the same passion for what I do. It's just great to see Tampa growing as exponentially as it is because it makes, uh, it makes our jobs uh, that much easier and, and Tampa is such a, an incredible sell. So, um, you know, it's all about relationships and, uh, and delivering on, you know, what you say you're going to do. And, and I feel like we've carved out a pretty good reputation and niche in this industry to be one of the leading sports commissions in the country. Amazing. Thanks for your time and for your insight, Jason, from Super Bowl to March Madness and hosting major sporting events in Tampa Bay. Thanks to our viewers for joining us on the Sports Playbook. In two weeks, our guest is Mark Sartori from RMC Events, who will discuss how his organization provides guest services and security staff for sporting events. We will see you then. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, 
please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.